Hey, everybody. Um, I guess it's afternoon where you are. It's early morning where I am. I'm um, south of San Francisco. <laughs> and I woke up early and went to New England Drupal Camp this morning and had a cup of coffee, you know, really early my time and then headed over here. Um, I love the format of virtual conferences because you can like be all over the planet on the same day and like see all your friends and hang out and stuff like that. So I think it's really cool. Um, I did post a link to the slide deck in the chat. Um, that is a slightly, slightly different deck than what I'm presenting, but basically the same. It just has a few extra slides because I had a little bit more time um, during the front end summit at Bad Camp. And then also because this is a session about accessibility, I posted a link for folks to view live transcripts. Um, if you click on the link, um, a window will open up and you'll see live transcripts as soon as I sit, sit, uh, hit the button. And I'm just going to hit the button now. Um, they're not perfect. It is an AI, but um, it's better than not having transcripts at all. Um, and then it's something that you can like download later and hook onto the node and stuff like that. Um, so where's everybody from is most people coming in from the netherlands this morning you can write in the chat i'm just curious where everyone where everyone is today netherlands yep <laughs> cool cool uh this is officially my first european speaking engagement which is kind of neat i've done like um north american and others, but this is my first European, so I'm really excited about that. Um, so it is only a half an hour presentation, and I have a, I'm very passionate about everything I talk about, um, including accessibility. So it is sort of jam-packed. So I'm going to get started. I know that people are kind of filtering in, but um, uh, some of the first slides are just some uh, like uh, guidelines and things like that. So I'm going to get started. And again, for people who are just joining, there's a link to the slide deck if you want it. And there's also a link to view live captions. And you know, you are um, at Accessible Media. Uh, my name is Amy June. That's Amy June, one word title camel case for you programmers. I work at Canopy Studios. I'm the open source community ambassador and the QA engineer over there. Uh, I am a hospice nurse by trade. So I understand how some folks have um, alternate ways of accessing information on the web. Um, I help organize Ally Talks, A11Y Talks, with my friend Carrie and Donna, where we talk about all things accessibility. Again, Canopy brings me here today. Um, we're hiring, so if you're looking for WordPress or Drupal work, um, check out Canopy. So first, I want to talk a little bit about accessibility and, and why should why should we embrace it when we talk about digital technology? And first, we have to understand what it means. So what is accessibility? In the context I'm going to talk about today, it's about producing very rich and engaging um, media that's accessible to everyone. And why do we design for accessibility? Well, it's the law in a lot of places, but that shouldn't be the only reason why we design for accessibility. Um, one reason could be that we want to include more people in our consumer base. You know, the more people that can access your information, the more people that can buy it or, you know, what have you. Um, but ex accessibility is essential for developers and designers and organizations um, that want to create high quality websites and the tools that go along with them. Um, and not exclude anyone from using those services. Um, and this is a, a, a United States figure, but um, according to the Center for Disease Control, 26% of people living in the US live with some, for, some form of disability. That's almost 61 million people. And as we extend out to more nations, you know that number gets bigger. So think of it as your a quarter of your consumer base um, uh, relies on how accessible your site is. And remember, you know, I'm getting older. As we all get older, we become more disabled with time. Um, our hearing and our sight deteriorate. Um, and then there's also things like uh, situational or conditional or temporary disabilities. You know, there's noisy workspaces. You know, you have your kids at home with the remote stuff going on. Um, 
when we eventually go back to traveling again, you're on a plane and you forgot your headphones and you're really relying on that closed captioning on your phone to watch your videos, um, you can't find your mouse. That's always my thing. So you rely on keyboard navigation. And then there's things like just using your smartphone or your iPad when you're at the beach and you know, having that glare um, keep you from being able to read the material. But we also need to remember that not every disability can be seen. You know, there's debilitating pain, there's fatigue, there's uh, cognitive dysfunctions, um, brain injuries, learning disabilities, as well as the hearing and vision impairments that a lot of people, you know, associate with um, accessibility. And being accessible means everyone can readily access your things. It's not about special privileges. It's about making sure that there's no barriers for folks, right? Um, and I'm just going to breeze through these because there's a lot of content to get through in a half an hour. Um, just some words to think about. And some of these are US centric, you know, um, but if you're developing websites that are going to be viewed in the US, this is something to think about. There's the American Disabilities Act, um, which pro pro uh, prohibits discrimination and guarantees that people that live with disabilities have the same access to information. Um, and this includes people outside of the local government. And there's 501 compliance. And then there's the WCAG, the WCAG Web Content Accessibility Guidelines. And that's really um, a reference, you know, it's a guidelines that we established for this criteria. You know, it goes down to, again, I'm just going to touch on these. Um, POR is a, is a, is a acronym for the four high level principles of perceivable, operable, understandable, and robust. Um, so I'm going to break that down. What makes our content and our media specifically accessible? Um, we want to make sure it's easy to see so we accommodate visual needs. We want to make sure that people can interact with it. Um, so we want to accommodate everyone's motor needs. We want to make sure we accommodate auditory needs. So we want to make our stuff easy to hear. And then we have to think about cognitive needs, making sure that our stuff is um, understandable. So we want to make the experience as a equivalent as possible, regardless of all of those things we can't control. Assisted technology, you know, um, the big things that come to mind, you know, like uh, mouses, um, screen readers, uh, and screen readers are very simply put, it takes the text and converts it into speech. Um, the technology, assisted technology really allows and empowers our users um, who live with low vision and cognitive and learning disabilities because it removes a barrier um, to the internet. It gives them a sense of privacy. They don't have to have someone read or manipulate their content for them. They can do it themselves. So think about that. You're allowing people the freedom to access the internet and whatever they want for themselves. You know, I talked a little bit about there's screen readers, keyboard, text to touch motion tracking, sensors, eye tracking. And we have to remember that lots of folks use our, their mobile devices for assisted technology as well. So we really have to think about responsive design these days. So the first thing I wanna to touch upon are images. Um, let's think about why we love images in our content. It's really because images enhance the content, especially for people who live with cognitive or learning disabilities. We include images and in media that support and add to the information. You know, folks who live with low vision sometimes use um, images for cues to help orientate them on the, on the page. And then media, including social media, use images for conversions. You know, having images on your posts um, lead to a higher click-through rate and a, a higher ROI, a return on your investment. But images can be major bar barriers when they're not accessible. Um, and not only that, accessible images benefit all types of folks. You know, not only people who use screen readers, but the text alternative um, can be read aloud and rendered as braille. Um, people who use speech input devices, you know, they can put the focus on a button and a linked image with a single voice command. Uh, text alternatives can be read aloud for people uh, browsing with speech enabled websites. Mobile web users, images can be turned off, especially for folks like me, I live rural, and I don't have um, uh, 
images turned on in my browser necessarily because it takes too long to load. And then if you're talking about investment, search engine optimization is something to think about SEO because images, once you add alternative text and make them accessible, now they're indexable by search engine. So your SEO improves when you have an accessible website. And there's all different kinds of images. I just highlighted six here and I'm gonna talk about them a little bit more um, in detail. There are simple images. You know, these are images that convey simple information and usually alternative text or alt text is sufficient. You know, your alt text is short and sweet. It's a description of the content of the image. You know, like this one would be the fender of a yellow Volkswagen bug. Um, the description should convey the content and functionality of the simple image as concisely as possible without adding a ton of details, especially if it doesn't, add to any of the value like uh, uh, it doesn't enhance the content. You know, a more complex image, you know, like a graph or a chart or perhaps diagrams, they contain too much information to be um, effectively described using alt text. So these images must be described with a long description, you know, and the long description is a more detailed description that provides equivalent access to the information on the image. You can see this Volkswagen bug is labeled. So you would have a long description that would actually talk about all of those different labels. Um, and really it comes down to a question. Given the current context, what information is this image intended to communicate? And that image, um, that information must be provided to people who can't see the image. Um, and then, you know, be sure to include any structure necessary to communicate the content of the image. You know, if it's like uh, includes any lists or data tables, things like that. Uh, decorative images. Now, the general rule with decorative images, and I don't necessarily agree with it, but you know, the standard protocol is if the image is purely decorative and doesn't convey any meaning, then um, you can mark it as decorative. Uh, these images can be borders or you know, spacers, corners, um, or maybe the image isn't contributing any information. You know, it's identified and described with um, the context around it, the text. But this is where I feel decorative images are important. If you use that decorative image to convey a mood or experience, it's only fair to have everyone be able to um, experience that mood, you know? So think about that when you when you label, label your images. You know, if you have an image in there that, you know, provokes emotion, it's only fair to describe it to folks. Images of text, um, readable text is sometimes presented in, in an image. Um, if the image is not a logo, we really want to avoid text and images. Um, but if you do use text and images, the text alternative should contain the same words as in the image. Um, and there's a couple of reasons for why you don't really want to use images of text. Um, actual text is much more flexible than images. It can be resized without losing clarity. And the background and text colors, um, can really be modified to suit the reading preferences of the users, where an image of text, it can become distorted and pixelated when zoomed in. Um, but again, if you can't avoid using um, images of text, make sure that the text contains the same text as the image. And then there's groups of images, you know, multiple images that convey uh, perhaps a single piece of information. The one on the screen is a, a, a rating of a Volkswagen um, dealership. And the text alternative for one image should convey the information for the entire group. So up on the screen, what are there? Five stars. So there's five stars um, and they show a combined rating. You know, there's, there's three stars that are filled in and one star that's empty a quarter of the way filled in and then one empty star. So the text alternative for just the first image would be rating 3.25 out of five stars. And then all of the other images would be left um, null. Image maps, you know, these contain multiple clickable areas and they can be things like org charts, um, park maps, decision trees. 
And the text alternative for an image that contains multiple clickable areas should provide an overall context for the whole set of links. And then each individual clickable area should have alternative text that also describes the purpose or the destination of the link. And that's something to, to, to really be aware of in your, in your link text as well, not just your, your uh, uh, image text. You know, let the users know where that destination of their link is taking them, especially if it's an, to an external um, website. Um, images can be used for all different kinds of things. You know, we use them for pagination, anchor links, images, logos, you know, decorative images. Um, but we want to be careful when creating alt text attributes for image links. And I'm saying this again because it's important. Um, because the alt attribute has two requirements. It describes the image and then it tells the user what activating the link will do. And this can be a button too sometimes. So I want to talk a little bit about slideshows. Um, from an accessibility and a usability point of view, um, they're not always the best thing, right? Um, so I looked up, you know, to see if I could find some corresponding information about the way I feel about slideshows. And I found that W3 schools even um, say that slideshows are disputed from a usability perspective because their content is really just too hard to discover. Um, so making sure your slideshows are accessible improves usability with them, at, you know. And then just to, to clarify what a slideshow is, um, you know, lots of times they're prominently located and used to sometimes provide navigation or show page content. Uh, they're sometimes called carousels, sliders, and typical uses of these are uh, scrolling news feeds, um, headlines, tickers, you know, stock tickers, uh, featured articles, and image galleries. So to make a slideshow more accessible, we want to make sure that we style the carousel to make sure it's usable and readable. Um, if you use transition animations between items, ensure that the users can stop and resume the play. Um, you want to be able to turn the player off. And with that being said, you want to make sure that the controls are visible and accessible to the keyboard, mouse, and touch. Um, you want to make sure, because people are using a keyboard, that your controls are highlighted on focus. And then you want to make sure that if folks can get into your slideshow with the keyboard, that there's no keyboard traps, you know, that they can get out of the slideshow in a predictive way. Um, and back to those controls. Um, make sure that those controls are visible. You can see in this picture of this Volkswagen that um, on the, I hope that this translates right, on the left hand side, you can barely see the button under the bumper. And the only reason we can see um, the, the arrow on the other side of the Volkswagen is because I'm hovering over it. So if I wasn't hovering, that control is almost invisible. So be aware that your controls can sometimes have a, an image behind them. So be sure to have sufficient color contrast. And size and color really do matter when we talk about controls. And we want to make sure that there's a reasonable alternative to the slideshow, just like we do for our images. You know, the slideshow does not need to function with style sheets disabled, but the content needs to be available. So like images, you know, can you turn off the image and and still be able to relay all of your information. You know, can you turn off your CSS and be able to 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 find all of those informations and descriptions for those um, images? Um, and I'm going to talk about moving parts um, because accessibility is a moving target, and WCAG standards are changing very soon. So I want to highlight a couple of things. Um, Having content that blinks for more than five seconds can be extremely distracting. And for certain groups, including um, folks who uh, have low literacy, you know, uh, reading and intellectual disabilities, and, you know, people with cognitive um, disorders too, you know, um, when the content blinks, it makes it really difficult or impossible to interact with the West rest of the web page. So autoplay. A method must be provided to pause or stop any media content playing automatically, which lasts more than five seconds. So 
the rule is if it if it's if it doesn't last five seconds, you don't have to. But if your media does have that autoplay, at five seconds, it really needs to turn off or have a control. And then some moving parts that we don't always think about, you know, content that moves, you know, or auto updates can be a barrier to people who have trouble uh, reading that stationary text. Um, it can also be problematic for screen readers. Form notices, a form blinks an arrow near the uh, submit button maybe. And if that user finishes the form but doesn't activate the submit button, that blinking needs to stop after five seconds. Um, we need to think about the animations we use for loading. You know, a pre-loader animation is shown on a page, you know, sometimes with Ajax or something. And it requires a certain percentage of a file, you know, it represents the file being downloaded. Um, there's web advertisements on our on our sites, you know, if the advertisement blinks and gets the attention, it needs to stop after five seconds. And same things with slideshows and stock tickers as well. Videos. Um, how are we consuming videos on our website? And then we need to think about how your, our audiences are consuming those videos as well. Um, so we wanna talk about captions. Um, captions are basically text versions of the audio content that are synced with the video. And there's many situations that benefit from captions. And I talked about them a little bit earlier, but you know, there's those loud environments, you know, um, like airports or gyms, you know, and then there's the silent environments, you know, like quiet co-working spaces. And sometimes content can be better understood by people hearing and seeing the information, you know, maybe people who are not native speakers of the language. And then for some people, it's just easier and quicker to read um, the transcripts and captions than it is to watch the videos. So content in text form, such as caption files and transcripts, also add to your search engine optimization because now that visual content is text content. And captions should also include any other audio content, you know, that adds value like dogs barking, music playing, um, and captions can be either closed or opened. Closed captions is more common. Those can be turned on and off, whereas open captions are always on the screen. Um, but some folks like open captions because it allows more control over the location of where the captioning is, um, the size, the color, the font. Um, and closed captions are most common, like I said. Um, and a lot of times, uh, the functionality within the video players we choose um, displays uh, closed captions um, on top or immediately below the video area. And that's something to think about if you do add open captions to your site, if someone turns on closed captions, it might obscure um, the text behind it. Audio descriptions are separate narrative audio tracks that describe important visual content. And it really makes it accessible for people who are unable to see the video because, you know, ballets or operas, you know, Cirque du Soleil, there's a lot of music and dancing and there's a lot of valuable content in there. Um, so describing that is important. If the visual content is being conveyed through the audio, there's no need for those audio descriptions. And then transcripts, um, like what I have, if anyone clicked on the link, that's a text version of the media content. And that's the whole version where captioning sort of falls off the screen as it goes. A transcript is, is the whole file. Um, and they really need to provide, um, uh, well, let's put it, let's look at it in an easier way. They don't have to be word for word, but they should contain, you know, those additional descriptors as well, you know, explanations that are beneficial, you know, Again, back to like dogs barking, you know, indications of laughter or ex or explosion. And um, transcripts allow users of assistive technology to use Braille and other devices too. So, and again, now it's indexable by our search engines. So media players, um, there's all different kinds out there. You know, there's all kinds of third party things that you can you can use on your site and embed on your on your pages, you know, but how do you choose an accessible um, uh, video player. It's really about your needs. You know, how do you want to deliver your video? And it's important to consider all of um, making sure that everything's accessible. You know, does the media player support closed captions? Does the media player support audio descriptions in a way that enables um, the 
the narration to be toggled on and off. Can are the buttons um, visible and are they op can they be operated with a mouse and a keyboard? Um, are the players buttons and controls labeled, you know, so people can understand what they do when they push a button before they push it. Um, and then is the player fully functional, you know, um, including all of the accessibility features across all the platforms and across all the browsers. Remember, some assistive tech works better in certain operating systems. And I'm like short on time, so I'm going to like breeze through this, but responsive design is super important. Um, the smartphone market um, is huge. Um, it's estimated that um, 80% of the world's population now use a cell phone. And I talked about it before that a cell phone or a mobile smartphone is really an accessibility device for some folks. Um, so when we look at our sites on, on our small screens, we, we want to make sure that people can use it, you know, so we want to provide large click targets. You know, what's a click target? It's a link, it's a button, it's a control. Because we think about users who have movement movements and, you know, maybe palsy or, you know, a shake. Um, or maybe even someone who has um, a large finger, you know, and can't quite get to that small button. We have to think about people who have tremors or spasms and how they are activate the targets on those web pages. You know, increasing the target area for those users can really, really maximize their chances of actually accurately selecting what they want to select, you know, that target on the web page. And then, you know, something to think about on the cell phone um, when we when we design our sites for responsive is the content should not be restricted to that single orientation. Folks should be able to flip the orientation from portrait to lands landscape. And then, you know, some other things to think about, you know, be sure the control me mechanisms can be activated with gestures, movements, and voice, you know, um, make sure that you have suitable layouts for the mobile devices, you know, a multi-column layout doesn't work well on a nar narrow screen. Um, the text size may need to be increased, so it's legible. Um, think about high resolutions, you know, many mobile devices have high resolution screens, and then because of that, they need higher resolution images so the display can look crisp and clean and sharp. Um, zoom features, you know, that's super important. People use the zoom feature. So uh, make sure you use viewports, you know, it's, it is possible to disable zoom, you know, but always ensuring that resizing is enabled is super important for devices, you know, and think about people who scroll and it can be cumbersome to scroll both horizontally and vertically at the same time. And then we need to be aware about how our users are inputting, you know, inputting data tends to be more annoying for those um, than the equivalent experience on desktops, you know, it's, it's worth trying to minimize the amount of typing needed, you know, when, when we're on a cell phone. This is important for me because I love live music shows. Um, and in the states we have uh like ticket uh live nation where you log into a site and then you have a certain amount of time to fill it out or you lose your tickets so if possible elements should be should not be subjected to a time limit you know allow users to use media at their own pace um, if a time limit needs to be in place, for example, for security reasons, the user should be able to have the option to turn it on or off or extend it. And, you know, just kind of talking about what to do now. Um, you work with your team, you know, know that when you work with your team and you work with a group of people, everyone's going to access your information differently. So really making sure that everyone has something to contribute really adds to the accessibility of your site. And communication is key, you know, setting up style guides, ensuring that WYSIWYGs have tooltips and everyone is trained on how to use them, use accessible fonts and color contrast. And again, accessibility is that moving target. Just because your site is compliant today, doesn't mean it will be tomorrow, especially after we add content. And I wanna thank everyone, because like I said, I knew this was a lot of information and I didn't have time for Q&A, but um, I go by Volkswagen Chick across the medias, like Twitter and LinkedIn and Drupal.org. And I'm always open to having conversations about accessibility. Um, 
If anyone has a question they want to ask, I probably have time for one. I don't think anyone posted any questions so far. Oh, you're welcome. And there is a longer version of this where I talk about, um, I, well, where I go in, in, in depth about why why the WCAG standards are the way they are. Um, and I can share that link on the node when the when the organizers open up the nodes for uh, for input. Thank you. And remember contribution days tomorrow. Contribution is my favorite part of Drupal. Um, and I'm gonna give a little mini workshop on how to give back to Drupal and like how to create a patch at the end of the day tomorrow. So um, I'm really looking forward to contribution day. <laughs>